Let's take a look at adding some data and navigating around a scene in Arial Odd. To do this, I'm going to use the small Ben Nevis files I've provided, and the link for those is in the video description. To add a height map, we want to click the Load Height Image box towards the top right of Arial Odd. Click on the red pixely square, and then what I need to do is go to where my files are. In this case, I've got them in a folder, and I'm adding the Ben Nevis Terrain ASC file. It's a terrain file. Aerial Odd can handle different kinds of height maps. ASC is one of the formats, but you can also add a PNG or a TIFF and click open. When I do that, I get a terrain layer. So I'm going to right click on the layer and just hold my right mouse button down and zoom around. So I can navigate like that. When you move around, it will go pixely and fuzzy as you're moving like this, and then it will resharpen when you stop. How long it takes to look sharp again depends on how fast your computer is. The major innovation in this version of Arial Odd is the ability to add color overlays. So to do that, I'm going to go to the load color image box, which is on the right under where it says color. And this is what I'm going to add. I'm going to add the Ben Nevis color layer. It's just a color terrain layer, which I created where lighter colors are higher. And that adds on top. If we want to turn it off, we can just click on the little use color map button. So the color layer remains in the project, but we can turn it on or off. And when I add this, you'll notice the color layer adds directly on top. It knows what it should be. That's because I created these files in QGIS and they were georeferenced and they were in the right place. But sometimes when you add a color overlay, that's not the case. It might be a different size or in a different location. So to show you this, I'm going to click on the color box again. And we're going to add in the Ben Nevis satellite small image. It's a PNG file. It's a satellite overlay, but it's quite low resolution. If I click open, you'll see the problem when I turn the color layer back on. It's bigger than the underlying terrain. In this case, it's actually twice the size. So we need to change the scale value to 0 0.5. And then it's going to be correctly overlaid. It is a low resolution file, which I've provided just so it works quickly. And sometimes you will have to match a color layer more manually in terms of its position. And that's what you can do with the X and Y variables under the color box. So if I move, I can move these around. So you can click the up and down arrows, left click, and you can move the cursor up and down and it'll do this. You can change the values manually. So if I change that to 50, for example, I can move it around. But you can move the position of the color overlay like this. In our case, so we don't need to do that, but that's how you would do it if you needed to. So it's in the right place. Now what I would usually do is I'll often change the background size from the default to something more like a 16 to nine screen ratio. So 1920 is what I'll put at the top, 1920 space 1080. And then what I might do is the default camera view is orthogonal camera down towards the bottom right. I'll change that to perspective. And then we've got the little cube, the view cube. We can navigate like that. If I click it again, it'll turn off. I can click on the camera ruler. We can use the vertical or horizontal ruler. And all I'm doing there is left clicking, holding the mouse button down and moving left or right. And if I want to hold in the middle mouse button to so the scroll wheel, hold it down, I can move things around. I can scroll in and out as well. If I want to move uh, without using that button, I can hold down the space key and then the left mouse button. I can do this. But if you want to move, rotate and spin things around, that would be the right mouse button held down. Another tip there, on the left, you'll see light settings. On the right, you'll see map settings. I like to make sure it says all so I can see all the settings. And then I can scroll down. You can scroll down with the mouse wheel, but if you do hover to the left of the screen, you will see a scroll bar. And the same happens if you go to the right of the screen, you'll see a scroll bar. But I like to make sure they're all showing and scroll down with my mouse wheel. At the bottom of the light settings, we can see color. For the ground at the moment, it's a dark gray. Click the color patch. I can use the slider here 
and I can manually pick colors like that. You can also click the little hamburger button icon there and change values to hex codes or RGB. At the moment though, I'm just gonna change this to like a white color. Okay, so that's some basics. The images I've created here, so the overlay is low resolution. So you'd usually use higher resolution imagery, but it works in exactly the same way. We can see the edges of our model. So the ground is kind of like a beigey color. If I turn off the color map for now, I can see to the right of that, that's the, that sets the color of the actual model. So I can make it lighter. And then I can turn on the satellite imagery again. You know, if I wanted to make it darker to maybe match the underlying terrain a bit more, I can do that. Or if I had an HTML color value I wanted to enter or RGB codes, I could enter them there. But for now, I'm just going to make this ground uh, light. There we go. One other thing which is kind of useful at this stage to know as you're getting into it is the grid settings. So I've given you some data. It's an ASC file which has got terrain in it. If I go to grid on the left, I can turn the grid on. I don't want a grid covering the map, so I'm going to check that. And what I want to do here, the spacing between the grid at the moment, I believe, is one meter. So let's change it to 10 meters. In this case, I think my data set, the units are meters. That wouldn't always be the case. The width of the grid is quite, it's quite narrow, so we can barely see the lines. So if I change that to 0 0.2 instead of 0 0.02, we can see the lines. Now, they're much too thick now, but I did that so you could see them. If I change it to 0 0.05, that'll probably give me some nice grid lines yep and then if I position that like this other things we can do we can before we go any further we'll just end in a second but the sky settings there's three sky settings the first one is uniform lighting which it will be on by default and you can always know what setting is on and what it's called if I hover over this as I am now if you look at the bottom of the screen there's a little uh, bit of text which tells you what you're looking at in this case it's uniform lighting if I hover over the next one it's atmospheric scattering and the third one is image-based lighting so I turn it to image-based lighting or I turn it to atmospheric scattering it'll change and then with atmospheric scattering let's take the sun angle towards the top let's take that down really low to five and then we can see it goes dark and this is when you start to need to understand how things work so the last thing I'll do there is now that I've changed the sun angle to five I'll go down to the film section and exposure and I'll bring the exposure value up like this so the sun's positioned behind and we can change the exposure value if I scroll back up on the left I can manually change the angle which would be from zero to 360 degrees I like to hold the left mouse button down when I see the two-way arrow and then I just sort of drag the sun around the scene like this. So I can drag it all the way back or forth. I like to do that because it gives me a nice preview. So I'll leave it at that for now. That's a few initial settings. You can experiment with these on your own. Just remember, the more powerful your computer, particularly the graphics card, the quicker this will work and the better your images will render in Aerial Auto.